Once again, we are coming to you from the Grant King Ray Shops here in uh, at 8155 Crawfordsville Road in Indianapolis. And now that things are lightening up, uh, you would really enjoy coming down here and taking a tour in the place. It's really quite, uh, quite it's a working museum, literally and figuratively. But if you'd like to stop by, call ahead. The number is 317-820-3959. It's worth the trip down to see. It's really quite the place. As you can see in the background, there's more cars, places full of cars. You'll enjoy it. Today's show is presented by Honda and Honda HPD, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the NTT IndyCar Series, SVRA, and McGilvery's Pub and Eatery and Speedway. And by the way, McGilvery's is open. You've got to go there. You won't believe what you see, and it is currently non-smoking. So stop on by. Founded in 1993 to spearhead entry into uh, IndyCar racing and Honda Performance Development has overseen successful racing efforts at all levels of the sport, from karting and quarter midgets to IndyCar and prototype sports cars. H HPD offers race engines and competition products for professional, amateur, and entry-level racers. For more information about HPD and the company's racing product lines, please visit hpd.honda.com. And if the best, uh, you can't wait to see a dentist, make it worthwhile. Go see Dr. Jack Miller and Dr. Lewis Lewis at the Indy Dental Group. You will love them, I guarantee it. Give them a call, make an appointment, number 317-846-6125. And if you're like me and have constant trouble with your computer, we have a new computer guy at A Plus Affordable Computer Doctor. Steve Fries is the man. Call him, tell him your problem, and more likely than not, since he's a doctor, he makes house calls. Give him a call, number 317-328-0766. And again, I've got to thank the Speedway Cable, Community Cable Company for their editing and helping us put this program on air. Uh, you wonder why these guys and gals want to drive race cars at 220 miles an hour. Well, there's a way to find out. Take a ride for yourself in the ra Indy Racing Experience two-seater. It'll be the thrill of a lifetime. I can almost guarantee that. So go to IndyRacingExperience.com and in the promo box put DK1. You get a 50% discount. Pick out your date. DK1 in the pro promo box and get a discount. You can call Shonda at the office. 317-243-7171. I guess, again, ask for Shonda Kennedy. Is it time to uh, redo your insurance for your home, your car, or your commercial property? Do what most of us have done. Call Mike Pardee at VP Insurance. They're located at 5004 West 16th Street in Speedway. Give him a call. Tell him what you're looking for. He'll tell you what he can do. And you'll find, like all of us have found, you get better coverage for less money. His office number, 317 2480070. That's VP Insurance. And if you are a vintage fan or a uh, Trans Am fan, you need to go to svra.com and subscribe to Speed Tour Magazine. It's a great first class magazine, great pictures, great stories, and it tells you places to visit when you go to the various venues around the country. That's svra.com and subscribe to Speed Tour. And while you're on the website, look at the schedule. Unfortunately, the uh, Invitational at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has been canceled, but they'll be performing around the country, hopefully. Um, do you have a vintage car? Would you like one? If your vintage car need to be restored, Grant King Shops can help you. Just give them a call, tell them what you got, what you need. I'm doing an interview. The number is 317-820-3595. If you have engine problems, they can help you there too. So give them a call. Grand King Race Shop, 317-820-3595. Um, my guest is a gentleman who started out his broadcasting career as a young boy uh, with a tape recorder, practicing calling races into a tape recorder. His goal was someday to get to the pinnacle. He's worked his way through. He's a college-educated young fellow. He's been uh, educating the youth of Central Indiana at both uh, Beach Grove and Monrovia. He's a foot, former football coach. And he is a broadcaster. has been working his way along. And I used to, uh, unfortunately, we did it where nobody could see I was with him. When he was calling races from the corners, I was with him uh, to help him out. So uh, I've known the man a long time. And strangely enough, he still talks to me. <laughs> he, has, he has elevated himself to a dream where he dreamed to be, and he's there. He is now the lead announcer for the IndyCar Series, and he is known as the voice of the Indianapolis 500. Please welcome Mr. Mark James. Thank Mark, you, how Tom. are you? 
Uh, I'm great. Thank you. And I hope you are well, too. And congratulations uh, to you for your efforts to continue to to entertain your legions of fans. Uh, thanks to technology, I, I know that it's a it's always been a labor of love for you. But um, considering the, the trying circumstances uh, that we currently find ourselves in, you know, the situation we've been in for the past couple of months, uh, I know you've not skipped a beat. I mean, you've continued to entertain and inform, but you've had some amazing guests. And uh, in many ways, this format has allowed you to get some guests that you might not otherwise be able to get in person. But uh, always uh, always enjoy spending time with you. And, yeah, our our travels together with you as my spotter are times that, uh, that I do remember fondly. So now you have that on videotape, and I can't ever deny it because I said it, you <laughs> have the proof. So. I told people – I, I tried to help. Mark kept an eye on action, and I said I had the other two eyes watching what was going on behind, <laughs> right. so we didn't miss anything. <laughs> we had three between good eyes of, between us for sure. So between the two of us, we had three eyes and covered it as best yep. we could. Um, w when you started recording and practicing, did you? What was your goal? What did you want to do? Did you want to become at some point the voice of the five hundred? Well, I, I could tell you that, you know, I, I either wanted to do something in sports, football, basketball, baseball. Uh, I was a race fan, so there was the, the natural attraction to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, considering I, you know, I was growing up just outside of Indianapolis in, in Monrovia, Indiana. Um, or I thought maybe I'd like to be, as they were known at, at the time, a, a, a disc jockey. And, and I would even you know, I had a little turntable in, in, in my room and, and, and I, uh, you know, I, I started listening to, you know, at the time WIFE uh, uh, with the wife, good guys. And then of course, WNAP when it started to become popular on the FM dial. And, and, and I actually taught myself how to back time uh, and hit the post, as they say, the music bed that leads up to the, to the intro of, of the song where the lyrics start. Um, but, you know, oddly enough, when I graduated from high school, uh, the opportunity uh, that I was given at WCBK in Martinsville uh, was was as a newsman. And I had written uh, a lot of news uh, for our school paper my sophomore, junior and senior year. Um, and, and while certainly I, I don't know that any kid who, who has designs on a career in broadcasting necessarily wants to grow up to be a newsman. Um, some do, I'm sure, but most don't. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I, I, for whatever the reason, I had the sense to say, okay, why don't I take this and then see what else I can do with it? And, and so, you know, after I got in uh, and started doing morning news, um, I, I, I started to, to, to say, okay, if you need someone to, to play music on Sundays, uh, not married, uh, don't have any kids. I live still living with my parents. I said, you know, uh, I'm your guy. Um, and, and, and he, uh, God bless Dave Keister, who passed away recently. And it was a, a, a tragic loss for, for Indiana broadcasting as a whole. Uh, but, uh, but, but Mr. Mr. Keister took me at my word because one of my first assignments, my first year there, uh, was being a part of the Christmas music spectacular. I had to go in at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve and I played Christmas music uninterrupted <laughs> until seven o'clock Christmas morning. And uh, I, I, I got three breaks an hour. I played three minutes of commercials at 20, 40. And then at the top of the hour, I played two minutes of commercials and did a 30 second weather forecast. And then it was right back to music. And after eight hours of Steve and Edie's Christmas carols and uh, the, the, the Brady Bunch Christmas carols, I walked in my mom and dad's house for Christmas that morning. My mom had a Christmas LP by Elvis on the, on the, on the stereo. And I said, I'm sorry, I just can't. I've listened to it for eight hours and I just can't. Uh, and, and she complied luckily for me, but, uh, but no, I, as I look back on it now, um, I, I think it was the right move at the right time for me. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful uh, that I had that opportunity at, at a small market station in Martinsville, Indiana. And, um, and quite frankly, without the opportunities that, uh, that Dave Keister, John Taylor, who was there at the time, and Dave Sockel, who was the sports director, without the opportunities that they gave me at the time, uh, there's no question that, that I'm not sitting here right now doing what I'm doing as, as the voice of the 500. You know, it, it's interesting because um, when I started – and and you came on board. And when the Indy Racing League started, I started paying attention to the radio network, the IMS radio network. And uh, I looked forward to races because sitting in the production trailer with you 
and Dave the King and Chris Pollock and Wally. It was a, a stand-up comedy hour from the time you opened the door until the time the race started and you left. Good grief. But it was a fun group and everybody got along. And I think it obviously showed because the listenership skyrocketed. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting. I remember when Dave Wilson first started traveling with us and, and we would all sit together, as you mentioned, at dinner in our production truck or whatever. As you know, Dave for years was a stand-up comedian. And I think the thing that he was most surprised about is that he would tell jokes and we would actually laugh. And Dave was <laughs> not used to that in his career. That was, a, that was a bit of a departure for Dave. And so, you know, he was able to finally realize that, yes, to a certain crowd, he was indeed funny. And uh, I, I would say that, that, that the more the adult beverages flowed at dinner, the funnier Dave got. I don't think that's an accident. But, no, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, you know, if, if, if we're all uh, going to travel that much together and spend that much time together, uh, there first and foremost has to be a healthy respect. But, but as you accurately pointed out, you know, there were one or two people that came on board with that deal. And, quite frankly, their skin was not nearly thick enough. And uh, – <laughs> And uh, it wasn't the pressure of the job. Uh, it, it, it was simply, you know, the, 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 the jabs and uh, daggers that we would uh, playfully uh, toss at one another. But, you know, I, I think my daughter put it best. Um, when I was in turn three, I would take my children when they graduated from high school. I would take them with me as my spotter as a graduation present for them. And at my daughter came, you know, we, we, at that time we did the, uh, we did the caravan in for the old Bush stadium. And, and then we would have breakfast and, and have the meeting and everything. And, and, and my daughter on the way home from the race that evening, I said, well, what'd you think? And said, you know, dad, um, she said, if I may be brutally honest here, she said, it is perhaps the largest collection of first class smart asses I've ever seen assembled in my life. She said, but the amazing thing is when you turn the mic on and you guys go to work, it's all business and you're the best at what you do. And, and, and I, I've never forgotten that observation that she made. And, and I think that, you know, I'd like to think that that pretty well describes us to a T. Uh, how, how has I, IMS Radio Network elevated itself over the years? How has it improved or how has it gone backwards? How, how is it from when you first started? Well, I, I think what I'm most proud of is that if, if you go back, uh, if you download the TuneIn app, for instance, um, on your smartphone or listening device, uh, we have 24-7 uh, vintage races. It, it, you might hear the 1967 uh, Indianapolis 500, and then after that, you might hear the 2015 race from Long Beach. Uh, but it's all vintage races uh, from, from the IndyCar series, from the IRL, and then going all the way back to the 1950s. And uh, I, I think if, if you go back and, and listen to Sid's era um, and, and then Paul's era, and then, you know, the two years that Lou Palmer was the anchor, then Bob, then Mike, then when Paul came back and now to me, I think what I'm most pleased about is every anchor has, has, has put their spin on it. I mean, let's face it, Sid cast the die, set the template, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and, and while I, I'm not sure that the way the broadcast was produced uh, in, in 1967 uh, would be effective in 2019, uh, I still think at the time they were the best at what they did. And keep in mind, they only did that once a year. Um, you know, when, when Paul took over for Sid, um, you know, Paul kind of shut the door to the broadcast booth. He did not want the parade of guests in that, that, that Sid enjoyed. Paul wanted to focus on the race. Um, and, and then I think, you know, Lou uh, made some, some changes and, and modernized it a, a bit. And then when Bob took over, Bob created separate, and I'm speaking in broadcasting ease here, uh, there's off-air channels called Intercom where we can communicate. Bob wanted to separate the pits from the turns and he hired a pit producer, someone to communicate with the pit reporters so he could focus more on the structure of the broadcast and calling play by play. Um, Mike, I think has to be given a lot of credit because we had a lot of storytellers in the turns once upon a time because cars moved so much slower in those days. And as the speed of the show and the speed of the cars progressed, Mike King, I think, is to be commended for bringing in an Adam Alexander or a Chris Denary. I think putting me in the turns, putting guys in the turns, leaving Jerry Baker in one, 
guys that had background in sports play-by-play. Uh, that was a necessity because you didn't quite have time to tell stories. You know, I mean, Howdy Bell one time in turn two, um, I, I, I've heard it, and I actually asked him about it. Howdy Bell one time made the observation as Johnny Rutherford was on the parade lap. Well, Johnny's really going to be a happy boy, and I'll tell you, I know Johnny very well, and he likes homemade strawberry ice cream. So he's, he's going to be a happy boy when he gets to victory lane. I, I can't imagine Michael Young making a homemade strawberry ice cream reference in turn two because by the time he did that, the car would already be in the north end. Uh, but, 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 but then, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Paul continued that tradition. Um, I, I think the thing that I added is, you know, we have sponsorship commitments. Uh, we have guest commitments that we simply must honor. Uh, my goal is to get all of those taken care of by lap 100 because the final 100 laps of the 500, I want the focus to be on the race. The other thing that I did is I uncovered our booth conversation. Uh, I covered up our booth conversation and went back to PA more with the pre-race festivities. Uh, I certainly did that for the other races at Long Beach and, 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 you know, Iowa and Texas and places like that. I brought back the invocation and I brought back the anthem because I, I think that that brings the audience closer to the event and it helps build the momentum up to the green flag. So um, having said that with the different approach that each anchor has taken, I'm proud of the fact that each anchor put the event itself front and center and uh, allowed the event to be the event and not consider themselves bigger than the event. And I, I think every anchor that we've ever had is to be commended for taking that approach. We're there for the listeners first and foremost. Now, do, do you enjoy, as you said originally, Sid and Paul and so forth did just the 500. That was it. Then IMS Radio Network started covering all of the events. Do you guys travel to all of the events is it a letdown after the 500 or is it, you know, excitement leading up to the 500 from a broadcast booth or is it the same? It's a race and you're there to call it and you're there to tell it and you tell the story because you're on a radio and you can build in somebody's mind what's going on and tell them what's going on so they can visualize it in their mind. I'm about to say the second nice thing to you in oh this interview. So I want you to, to bookmark this as they say, that's, that's, <laughs> That's, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, every year after the 500, we've discussed it. We always look forward to going to Detroit. I mean, we take a couple of days after the 500 and we catch our collected breaths and, and relax a little bit. And, and, and first of all, it's a magnificent event. What, what Roger Penske and Bud Dinker and their entire team uh, have accomplished up there at Belle Isle is, 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 is I think, one of the uh, – uh, one of the one of the best stories in motorsports in terms of the impact that they've had on the overall renovation and renaissance of, of beautiful Belle Isle. Every year you go back there, you see improvements that they've made, and and it's now starting to work its way out from from Belle Isle throughout that 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 neighborhood and the city of Detroit. And they're very proud of that event. They put a lot into it, uh, for sure. Um, but no, I, I'm I'm fortunate that that. Uh, it's not only a one time a year thing for me. I mean, you, you stop and think about the, the places that, uh, that we get to go and the, and the things that we've seen. I mean, you know, for years we did our international races from the booth at the Speedway, but, but one year, thanks to the good folks at Honda, Mike King and I, you know, had the chance to go to Twin Ring Motegi. Um, it, it, but not only has it benefited me, Don, it's also benefited my family because, as you well know, my, my children when they were younger and, and, and my wife have accompanied me on a lot of trips. And, and, and you know, they've seen, a, seen and done a lot of things that uh, otherwise they might not have had the opportunity to, to, to have done if this was just a, a one time a year thing. So, you know, while certainly the energy level, we approach this broadcast similar to the way the drivers approach it. I know it's it's a double points paying weekend, but, but as you well know, Don, um, that is the one time of the year throughout the championship chase that you will not hear any driver, any driver really reference the championship much. Uh, their focus is solely, totally, and completely upon winning the 500. And, and I think our approach is like that too. Most of what we do and how we do it is very, very different for that month with everything that we do. And I think we're solely focused on, on that event and, and we don't give a lot of thought to the other venues until the, the dust settles on, on the 500. Uh, you know, this just crossed my mind as you were talking. Now, when your wife or your kids introduce you to somebody you might not know, do they say, 
uh, this is my dad, the voice of the 500. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, they bring that up more than I do. As you know, um, you know, I didn't publicly necessarily embrace that. And, and I don't, I, 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 it, that doesn't come up in conversation very often uh, with, with people when I meet them. Um, the one though that, that changed my way of thinking uh, on that a little bit, I have to give a lot of credit to, to Paul Page uh, because Paul and I had that, you know, very discussion o over dinner at, at, at one night and, and Paul told me, he said, uh, listen, he said, uh, you're as much the voice of the 500 as Sid or Bob or Mike or me or anyone else. And he said, you've earned it. And, and I think you need to embrace it uh, because if you don't, uh, people aren't going to. So, you know, he said, you'll handle it the right way. Uh, he said, but do, do be proud of it. Now, I, I know my, my daughter, when she was hired at Decatur Central High School, uh, her building principal is, is a lifelong friend of mine, a fellow Monrovia grad. And, and when he introduced her to the staff meeting, uh, he did introduce her as the daughter of the voice of the 500. Um, and, and, you know, my, my son from time to time will have people asking, Hey, are you in relation to the guy that does the, 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 the Indy 500 and does the Indy car stuff? So that, that is kind of cool. And, and, and my wife is uh, probably a little quicker to tell people who I am and what I do uh, more so than I. And uh, it's, it's, it's very humbling though. It, it, it really is. And it's uh, it's something that we're proud of, and it's a, it's a title that we're we're becoming increasingly more comfortable with as time goes by, for sure. Um, you know, it's 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 interesting to me how this whole thing gets on the air around the world. When you see a little truck, and you figure out what can you possibly do from there, but what they can do is put the broadcast out to the world, um, and and what we're doing right now. And my uh, IT guru sitting over here to the side can attest. He said, uh, well, we're not going to be doing the program from Gilbert. You want to do it by Zoom? And I thought he was talking about that car commercial. The guy goes, Zoom, Zoom. Yeah, that's right. He said, no, no. It's, it's a software or it's an internet program that we can do. You can do interviews. You can talk to people live. I said, okay, do you know how to do it? Yes. So here we are. Stuff I never thought, and I'm sure you never thought a lot of the things you're doing now. You, I never thought of that being able to be done, but it is. Well, I, I, we, I was on the committee to hire a new football coach at Monrovia and we interviewed five candidates and we did it just like you and I are doing the show. I mean, I was here at my kitchen table and I had all my notes spread out and, and there were nine people on the committee and we were all able to be on at one time with that candidate and, and, and do the interview. And, you know, if, if it weren't for this technology, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sure that process would have been much more difficult to have gone through. My wife, uh, Desiree, an academic advisor at IEPUI, and she's been able to do about 99 and 9 tenths percent of her job uh, from, from right here. And she can meet students either over the phone, she can have email conversations with them, or she can do like we're doing right now and, and, and have an advisory sessions with them via Zoom. She just recently wrapped up uh, just a few minutes ago uh, a, a meeting with the staff in their office, which they do a couple of times a week. So, yeah, I mean, um, as time goes by, I'll, I'll give you a little insight to, I, I think, further the point of what you're discussing. A couple of years ago, we were in Detroit, and for whatever the reason, we get about 15 laps from the finish, and our RF gear, which our pit reporters use to, you know, keep in communication with us and call their pit stops and whatnot, it went out. For whatever the reason, there was a transmission issue, there was an antenna issue, whatever the case may be. Well, Dave First, who was working Pit Road at the time, uh, came up with the idea and got together with the other pit reporters on Pit Road. And what they did in the post race, uh, the second and third pit reporters got second through fifth, Dave went to victory lane. They did their interviews with the drivers of the post race on their cell phones. And they created a file and shipped it back to Chris Pollock, who was running master control at the time in Indianapolis. And Chris got them turned around, edited them, and we got them on the air in, in the post race. And no one knew that those interviews weren't live. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't that long ago that we just wouldn't have had any post race interviews, which really takes a lot from the story. So, I mean, I think we're fortunate to live in, in the times that we live in terms of technology and, and, and what it allows us to do for sure. And it benefits the, the, the listener and the viewer for sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, early on that you have sponsor commitments that you have to uh, take care of during the broadcast. Is there a sales crew for IMS Radio Network or is this stuff that 
you pick up or how does that happen? Well, I think that, um, you know, by and large, especially for the Indianapolis 500, I think over the past couple of years, you know, we, we've employed agencies on behalf of the radio network, but, uh, you know, I, I think over the past couple of years, those responsibilities have been folded into sales and marketing uh, for IndyCar and now, now Penske Entertainment. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense to, to, to do it that way because, you know, we're, we're all, you know, one big happy family. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there are some opportunities uh, that we've had in the past to go out and, and secure some sponsorships outside of what uh, that group is doing. But, uh, but I think by and large, as time goes forward, uh, we're all one big happy family. And, and I think that's the way it was for a number of years, which I can gather and glean from, from listening to the shows. I mean, you know, I, I think the sales staff at IMS went out and took, took care of that and then, and then worked with the, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network in terms of what sponsors they had commitments to. So um, I, I think what that does, that eliminates, you know, layers and confusion and things of that nature and kind of funnels it all into, into one general area and, and makes it easier for everyone to determine, you know, who's going to be used and, and where in terms of their sponsorship. And, 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 and we, can, we can offer, too, as a, as a radio network, uh, the kind of immediacy and I think a value added element that I'm not sure that you can get uh, from, from, you know, the television partner, just by the way that it's structured, for instance, if, uh, if Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan racing has a sponsor uh, at the racetrack, uh, we'll offer them an opportunity to come on a practice session or a qualifying session, or maybe even in race. Uh, and then what we'll do, we'll, re we'll, we'll download that interview, send it to, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, and then allow them to forward that on to the client and, and give them the opportunity to get a little more bang for their sponsorship. But I mean, when, when Zach Veach was working on the Gamebridge sponsorship, uh, you know, he worked with us for a year or two while he was trying to get his career back on track and looking for the right opportunity. And, you know, he had those folks come to the, uh, the racetrack several times throughout the course of the year. And, and we offered them the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about their sponsorships of, you know, the LPG event, LPGA event and other things. And I, I think Zach would agree that there was some benefit to that, um, you know, and, and I think it worked out well for him. And, and we're happy to be able to provide those opportunities for our sponsors because ultimately everybody wins when, uh, when, when your sponsors are happy, whether it's radio, television, the series, teams, or whomever. Um, I might mention that uh, in the off season, you don't just sit around and shovel snow and rake leaves and so forth. You uh, are involved in the uh, streaming, I guess it is, uh, of uh, IHSAA events. You mentioned baseball, basketball, swimming. You've done it and are doing that in the off season. Yeah, I've been fortunate. I believe uh, 2001 was the first year I was asked to work with the IHSAA Champions Network. I did radio for a couple of years. And then uh, uh, Bob Lovell, who, uh, who's with Network Indiana and host Indiana Sports Talk and affiliates all over the state. Um, Emma's Communications, our flagship uh, station and company in Indianapolis, uh, uh, developed uh, the idea of uh, uh, the late Tom Severino came up with the idea to start uh, streaming uh, sporting events online, high school sports. And uh, Bob and I had worked together for a number of years um, in various capacities, and, and Bob invited me to do the games with him. Uh, and then, then Emma's worked out an agreement with, uh, with the IHSAA uh, Champions Network. Those two entities were kind of folded into one, and uh, then we were off and running. Uh, we're doing a myriad of sports for the IHSAA, and then the Champions Network continued to grow and thrive, and and, uh, and and then started having more control over their television property. Uh, started expanding the number of sports offerings beyond just you know the traditional stick and ball sports, and um, it, it literally was in the right place at the right time, and had the opportunity to to kind of transition to television. Uh, for football, boys and girls, basketball. Now our, our wrestling show, uh, state championship and wrestling is on television. Uh, some of the other sports uh, remain streaming, but um, uh, we, we were kind of there in its infancy and, and, and have enjoyed being along for the ride and, and helping to build that entity for sure. Now this year there's been a change in the booth with you. The last couple of years has been uh, Anders Crone, but his, uh, Coforce business has grown so much that I guess he's not available 
as much as here. So Davey Hamilton has returned to the booth. Uh, I thought, you know, I thought Anders did a great job, as did, did Davey, and I always found interesting with them. They could see something that w could happen, and they, they understand what does happen because it's happened to them. As Paul Tracy points out a lot of times, what's the big deal with that? I've done that. It's just a racing incident. So I, you just go on. And I think uh, Davey coming back into the booth with you is, is a step certainly in the right direction. Well, I know Anders likes to say that it was because of his quote force business, but quite frankly, Don, I, I deal with kids all day, every day in school, and, and I'm tired of dealing with a child as I've dealt with the, an, an, <laughs> like Anders. The, I'm, I'm telling you, man, you talk about a Red Bull. You talk about an energy drink. I mean, we, when, the first time Anders Crone ever worked uh, an Indy Lights race with me in Baltimore several years ago, I mean, it was kind of like with Zach Feach. Uh, and, and even Kyle Kaiser more recently, it, there was not a lot of preparation. There was not a lot of do this, do that. I mean, the guy just, just hit the ground running. And, and I always go back um, to Anders and the, and the thing that, that I'll never, ever forget. We were at Mid-Ohio, and we were calling a practice session. And, and Alexander Rossi came in front of us down that short straightaway right outside the booth. And as he went into turn one, Anders was watching the multi-screen monitor, and there was a, the helmet cam shot of his hands in the cockpit. And Anders said, okay, now, now see here as he goes into turn one, he makes that left-hander. You can see that wheel's really fighting him. And then as he gets back into the throttle, you see he wrestles the wheel back. And so for whatever the reason, I had the sense to say, okay, this is going to be pretty good here. So I said, Anders, I said, I'll tell you what, what, why don't you stay with this? I'll lay out, you call this lap. And I'm telling you, it, it was as impressive as anything that I've ever watched or ever heard. And, um, you know, I think he simplified things, but his passion and enthusiasm and the way he blended with our crew um, is, is uh, something that I'll always be deeply appreciative of. He became a friend, uh, not just a coworker, but a friend. Uh, I enjoyed the two years that I spent with him immensely. And, 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 you know, he said he'll be around the racetrack. And of course he knows the booth is always open, but I, I'll be honest with you. You know, we, we were doing a little bit of hand wringing over it um, and how we would replace him. Uh, and then at, uh, at Laguna Seca last year, uh, Davey sent me a text and, and Wally Levitt kind of reaffirmed it and said, Hey, Davey thinks his role's going to change a little bit with Harding Steinbrenner. And, you know, he, he's got some interest in coming back at some point. And so, you know, I texted him right away. We met that morning in the paddock and, you know, that deal was done uh, within just a few minutes. And uh, again, there's a familiarity there that Davey and I had when we first worked Indy Lights together and then moved to the IndyCar series. And uh, I think Davey's last couple of years uh, dealing with this new chassis and being involved with a couple of different race teams, I think is is going to be really beneficial in terms of the insight. And much like Anders, when Davey walks through the paddock, if he's got a question, he's going to find somewhere and find some way to get it answered. And so, uh, you know, we've been blessed with tremendous driver analysts over the years with the, with the radio network, and the list goes on and on and on. But uh, um, it, it, we're, we'll miss Anders, certainly, and we thank him for lending us his incredible talents and professionalism. I love the guy to death. Uh, but we, we are, as a, collectively as a group, thrilled to death to have Davey Hamilton back with us for sure. Now, it was announced a, a few uh, about a week ago that the Indy Lights has suspended their season, canceled their season. How big an effect do you think that will have on the ladder system? Well, I mean, I, I think that um, the re for the reasons given, the reset, if you will, uh, I think makes sense at this point. Uh, fact of the matter is, uh, they've since since Sam Schmidt um, kind of refocused his efforts more directly toward IndyCar. Um, I, I think that um, you know it became difficult in terms of of car counts. Uh, I know that Dan Anderson and Anderson Promotions have worked tirelessly to try to reduce the cost because they are significant. Uh, and, and I think they've made great strides toward that. Uh, but I, I, I think more work needs to be done in that regard, and I think that's what they've pledged to do. Uh, I think it's very, very important for something like that to exist. And if you don't think it is, just look up and down the roster of the drivers that will start um, 
you know, the race Saturday night. And let's not forget, since, since Dan Anderson took that over, sure, there's not been the growth in Indy Lights that maybe you would have liked to have seen in terms of car counts. But, well, I think, you know, the, the drivers, that's the easy thing to point toward. But, you know, we've had teams move up in the series, but we've had crew chiefs and we've had engineers. And it's not only been a ladder system for drivers, but it's been a ladder system for for, for people on the other side of the wall, too. And I, and I think that's that's huge. Um, but, you know, there's even been a handful of sponsors that have dipped their toe into motorsports for the first time with uh, – with, with the Indy Lights and the Road to Indy and then decided to, to move that sponsorship toward IndyCar. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, Penske Entertainment, Roger, his group, I think Mark Miles, Jay Fry, uh, Dan Anderson, uh, that whole Anderson promotions team, I have every reason to believe that, um, that they'll, they'll work tirelessly uh, on the reboot and uh, hopefully we'll see a, a, a bigger, more stable uh, product return uh, next year for the season opener because I, I I mean I think it's something that everyone is in agreement that the series sorely needs to ensure that uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a a more than adequate feeder system for the NTT IndyCar series. Since the uh, change in stewardship, I don't like to say ownership because I think Roger Penske is here more as a steward to take care of the place and build it into bigger and better things. But has has things changed for IMS Radio Network? Does he appreciate what you do and is aware of what the network does and the number of people it reaches? Uh, has, has your job gotten better? You got you know things looking positive from the Enter Penske Entertainment side? We haven't had a race yet. I don't know. <laughs> so, let me say this. <laughs> we had some off-season meetings with the powers that be, S.J. Ludke, Kate Davis, and some others. And I I'm excited about our relationship uh, moving forward. Um, you know, I, I obviously have a healthy respect for, for Roger Penske and all that he has accomplished. Um, I, I, I just like his approach to things. I like his management style. And, and I think that, you know, S.J. And, and, and Kate especially have expressed to us uh, the significance and the importance of what we do and how we can help them in so very many ways. Um, and um, I, I have every reason to believe that our relationship right now is as strong as it has ever been and, and will continue to be a, a, a valued member of, of this company. I, I have always felt um, that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network, I think, has played a pivotal role in building the importance and the significance of the Indianapolis 500. I, I think it's, it's a, 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 what Sid Collins did uh, in developing in this network back in the 1950s and all that it accomplished to the 60s and 70s and certainly the 80s and, and perhaps into the 90s. Um, I don't think there's any question that it deserves a lot of credit for making this the, the greatest spectacle in racing. That, that, that you know, phrase originated through the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I have every reason to believe that, uh, we'll continue to be a valued part of that company and, uh, and continue to do, um, uh, what we've done, which is, uh, provide a great, great product for the fans and, and, uh, provide a conduit by which our fans can, can, can better connect to their, their favorite drivers and favorite teams. You know, with something you've heard, I'm sure a thousand times as I have from people that have been coming, they say, I've asked him, how did you get interested in racing? You're a farmer. I listened to it as a kid on the radio. Yeah. And that's where I got the interest and I had to see it. And like myself, I came down here to see the first race in, I don't know, 62, 63, somewhere in there. And I'm still here. I got yeah. hooked on it. And yeah. people come and they see it one time, they hear about it, they want to come and see it, they see it, and they're still here. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, and you know there are stories like that that are that are woven into the tapestry of that event for sure. And, and you know, I go back to 1996, my first year with the network, and you know, I knocked the rust off certainly, um, or I should say, I had the rookie stripes pulled off to a certain extent by going through you know the second weekend of qualifying because there were two weekends at that time, uh, and then certainly on carb day, uh, but then on race day. I, I think the magnitude of what I was doing finally hit home to me because I walk into our old offices, uh, which under the old 
main grandstand and, and master control tower configuration, we had offices on the ground floor below the tower. And so, you know, I walk in race day morning uh, for breakfast and I walk in and there's Bob Jenkins, there's the late Gary Lee, there's Howdy Bell, there's Chuck Marlowe, there's Bob Lamey, there's Ken Double, uh, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. Darrell Weibel comes by and says hello. Uh, Doug Zink, Ron Carroll, all of those guys are around and I'm thinking I, I'm, I'm clearly in the wrong room. I don't, I don't have any business that I'm, I'm corn fed kid from Monrovia, Indiana. I'll, I'll be leaving now. Um, you know, they all made me feel welcome, but I, I think the thing, as I walked in there, I realized the impact that, that all of those people had on my life and building my passion and enthusiasm uh, for the Indianapolis 500. And, and to think now, uh, you know, as I've discussed with Jake and, and, and Jake Query and um, Nick Yeoman and others, I mean, we have achieved a certain level of, of professional immortality by simply having been a part of this radio network. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to achieve in, in any career. Uh, I, I suppose mine has been heightened from beyond just being a member of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network to being the anchor. Uh, and, you know, you go into the museum and you see the display. And still to this day, Don, I mean, when I see Sid Collins and Lou Palmer and Bob Jenkins and and, and, and Paul Page, I, you know, I'm think, do I, I mean, should I, you know, be up there and, and uh, to be able to, to have the opportunity, you know, to be in that display with Mike King, who I worked so closely with for so many years in Terre Haute, traveled so many ra to so many races with, uh, that's pretty meaningful. But the most meaningful element of all of that, you know, we did a field trip, did some stories in the museum uh, right before this all happened with school in early March to take my students in there and show them that display and for them to see it. But more than anything else, to take my mom in there and have her see it uh, is, is, is pretty cool for sure. Well, the first race of the year is in just a couple of days on Saturday, June the 6th. And it will be before nobody, essentially. Uh, and I, I understand that if I get off my couch, or get up, leave from in front of the television, I can go down on 16th Street and join you as you broadcast the race. So you guys are not going. You're going to call it from right here at the Speedway, or in, in, the, in Indianapolis. Yeah, we, um, I'm going over Friday, as a matter of fact, to check out the satellite feeds. I mean, we'll have the, the multi-screen monitors we need. We'll have timing and scoring, and it'll be myself, Davey Hamilton, Jake Query, and, and Chris Pollock will be in our Indianapolis studios. And then our chief engineer, Rick Evans, and Nick Yeoman uh, will actually be traveling to Texas, and Nick will be uh, our, our lone pit reporter. Uh, now, Nick will not have the opportunities because of social distancing. Nick won't have the opportunities to do any face-to-face one-on-one interviews. He's not going to be climbing up on pit boxes and talking to crew chiefs. Um, but, but, you know, he'll certainly be able to call pit stops and keep track of those pit stops. Um, we have already prepared some interviews that we'll use during the practice session about drivers with their thoughts and impressions. Thanks to IndyCar Media uh, for all of the interviews that they've done with drivers in preparation for this. They're going to be very valuable for us in terms of having information to share with the listeners during the practice session. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll go on at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern and um, only have about a 15-minute pre-race show, which is much shorter. And then, of course, uh, going to be interesting to watch it unfold, Don. I mean, 35 laps on a set of tires is what Firestone is telling everybody. Uh, we'll see how people handle their pit strategy. We'll see how the handling of the race cars go. Uh, we'll see how the aero screen does with the sun and with the heat. It's going to be well over 100 degrees, which is no surprise. It's Texas in June, for God's sake. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, you've got a lot of drivers who have never driven on that track before, not been in an Indy car before. Um, and, and I think while all the drivers talk about taking care of one another and being careful to turn one early, um, as I've heard a lot of guys say that they're all well intentioned and have every intention of doing that, then they put the helmet on and go racing. And that's where the disconnect occurs sometimes. So well, that's we'll what see. it's called. It's called a race. And that's the whole idea. And, and, and what you're all shooting for is number one, cross that's the right. start finish line first. That's right. Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's always been fun talking to you. We chat from time to time. Uh, on the phone, if I hear something or something goes on, you'll give me a holler. Uh, you did uh, say that there will be no, just came out this morning, uh, uh, and we're doing this on Thursday, uh, that the uh, Brickyard will have no fans. 
Yeah, that weekend uh, it was announced by uh, Penske Entertainment uh, CEO and President Mark Miles that, um, you know, basically what it boils down to, and we, I, I guess we kind of saw this coming, uh, because this reopening plan has happened in stages between the governor's office and, and the various entities around the state. Indianapolis has been a stage behind with Mayor Joe Hogsett because, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of cases uh, uh, have, have been here in Marion County. And, and, and so uh, I, I don't think they felt as though that those numbers would match up to the point to where Marion County and the city of Indianapolis could jump ahead a stage or two to align themselves with the state. Uh, and again, Mark Miles, Jay Fry, Roger Penske, Doug Bowles, uh, Got to give them a lot of credit, I think. They're to be commended for their proactive approach to all of this going all the way back to St. Petersburg in September. It's not been reactive. It's been proactive. And this is just another example of that. Difficult decision for them to make, but we're three weeks before the event. And if they're going to make it, as they said, they had to do it now. And I'm disappointed for the fans, obviously. Uh, but I think, you know, once we get past that, hopefully things continue to improve and we'll be able to allow fans in, in into facilities and into the Indianapolis Motor Speedway by the time we get to the to the 500 in August. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like we're going to have any fans. But, again, uh, we'll be there, IndyCar Radio. We'll have our friends from PRN join us for that race weekend, and uh, we'll do what we always do, make you feel like you're there if you're listening to us. We hope you do. And you do it well. Thank you, Don. And I've, I've got to commend you for sending Nick down to Texas. I'd, I'd love to see him bouncing from one pit to the other, from one end of the pit lane to the yeah. other. <laughs> I've, I've, I've told him to be careful for sure, because it's going to be plenty warm down there. And I think he'll be able to stay far far enough away from the pit boxes and the fuel tanks that I don't know that he's going to have a fire suit on, but he'll have his mask on for sure. And he'll uh, follow the guidelines in terms of safe distancing, but we wish him and uh, our engineer, Rick Evans, safe travels. And we can't thank them enough for their commitment to our product and, uh, and, and, and being so, so willing to go down there. It's uh, it speaks well of them and what we're all about. Uh, and that is providing the best show possible for the fans. Well, in my opinion, you do it. In my opinion, having sat alongside you for as many years as I have, you are where you should be, the voice Thank of the you. 500. Thank you. I've, I've always appreciated your friendship and support. Gosh, that's three nice things I've said about <laughs> you in one show. I, I'm going to with all this social distancing, Don. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to keep a recording of this and keep it that's handy. Right. Yeah, yeah, do so. In case anybody says, does anybody care about you? I got one. That's Here right. Is, and I'll play okay. for it. I'll gladly jump on that grenade, Don. I won't have a problem doing it. Thanks for being with us, Mark. And uh, we'll be listening to you on Saturday night. For, uh, are you going to be doing all of the practice and qualifying? You yep, do it all? yep. All Everything on, on practice and qualifying. And, uh, and, and, and you can find this, this for this race weekend, uh, XM205 carrying all the practices, uh, carrying the practice, qualifying, and the race. So we, we appreciate our friends at XM for, for giving us uh, that, that additional conduit for our fans. Well, now everybody knows where to find you. We look forward to listening to you. Thanks for all being right, Don, a guest. Take care. Appreciate it. My guest has been, as you heard, Mark James, the voice of the Indianapolis 500 and the lead, lead announcer for all of the IndyCar events. Um, we thank you for watching, listening. We have some more on uh, upcoming, so stick with us. We will be back. Until the next time, Don K. saying thanks. See you next time.